Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Masahiro Morioka. He is a professor of philosophy at, and ethics at Waseda University in Japan. He is considered by many to be one of the most influential thinkers in the current Japanese philosophical community. He is the director of Tokyo Philos Philosophy Project and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Philosophy of Life. He specializes in philosophy of life, life studies, bioethics, gender studies, and criticism of contemporary civilization. He is the author of books like Nihilism and the Meaning of Life, and the book we're going to focus the most on today, Manga, Introduction to Philosophy, An Exploration of Time, Existence, the Self, and the Meaning of Life. So, Morioka Sensei, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, I will start with a question that uh, I think I rarely ask philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> but what is philosophy? Yeah, so this is a huge, big problem, big question. So I think um, there are two aspects in philosophy. And the first aspect is on philosophy as an academic discipline. And the second aspect is a philosophy as a way of life. And the first aspect, academic philosophy, is mm, to try to understand the structure of one's self or life or society and the world by using logical reasoning. So and we are academic philosophers are doing um, such activities in universities and in conferences. But at the same time, we have other parts, uh, the other, other side. You know, the second side is philosophy as a way of life. Um, and this term was made by French philosopher Pierre Adot. And yeah, this is a philosophy that actually makes our lives meaningful lives, you know, our lives better lives. So uh, philosophy is not just an exercise of our brains, but it should also relate to my our actual lives. So I think um, philosophy has at least these two aspects. And I believe that, you know, these two aspects of philosophy should be combined. Okay, so uh, I think currently, you know, these two sides are in a sense, and divided, but it should be more combined. And and I have published um, 20 books on philosophy and other related areas and in Japanese. And recently, uh, three of uh, my books have been translated into English and you can download from the internet. And the, the reason why I wrote Manga Introduction to Philosophy is that I wanted to combine these two aspects, you know, academic philosophy and philosophy as a way of life. And so in, in, in this manga book, I tried to find ways to attract ordinary people's attention to academic philosophy by using, you know, by using manga pictures, manga illustrations as an, an, a medium, mid media. So, okay, I would, I would like to um, show you some example from my, my manga um, book. So I would like to share my screen. Yes. Okay, so um, these pictures are from my manga book, man, Manga Introduction to Philosophy. And this part, uh, the right side person, this one, uh, the round face one, and, and, and the, the right person is sensei, a teacher, and the teacher say, let me ask you, where is your eye? And then this boy, this guy says, it's right here, pointing his um, brain, head. So um, and the sensei teacher said, where exactly? Then the guy replies, in my brain, I guess. Then the sensei and try to 
can um, open up his brain. All right, then let's take a look and the sensei um, opened his head and say, I is nowhere to be found. There is no eye uh, seeing anywhere inside his brain. And it and sense teachers say it's the same in my case. And he opens he, uh, his head uh, as well. And he said, it can't be found anywhere in the case of myself. Okay, so um, then the sensei says, in other words, it isn't like this. Okay, so I think this is the power of um, illustration, power of manga. So when uh, reading or seeing these um, pictures, ordinary people can easily get the point, you know, the philosophical point, what they are talking about and what they are um, trying to understand, you know, where is the eye, uh, where is the place of eye, and whether there is um, such a thing as an eye. Um, so, um, okay, so so this is, uh, so I think the manga is a very good tool for us to, mm -mm, us, uh, uh, us to uh, think about philosophical topics. So this is, yeah, I, this is what I, I'm, I'm trying to do, you know, the co combination to try to combine um, academic philosophical thinking and ordinary people's um, very, very basic question about existence or other time subject on life and other very um, basic, basic philosophical topics. Yeah. And do you think that uh, these questions that philosophers ask, particularly when it comes to the philosophy of life, is mm -hmm. something that, uh, as you say, ordinary people can mm -hmm. relate to, or that sometimes they can be too abstract? Yes, I, mm, I think that many people um, have already have some kind of philosophical questions in their mind. So um, I think many, yeah, many, almost all people all already have had uh, philosophical questions, basic philosophical questions, but uh, in many cases, they might not have um, language to express these uh, philosophical questions in because um, probably they do not necessarily know uh, the philosophical terms and jargons. So, but I, I believe that many people have some kind of uh, philosophical questions. So, um, I think academic philosophy and uh, philosophical uh, thinking thinking um, can be a good guide for them, for ordinary people when they face difficult philosophical questions in their actual life, especially when they, when, when they uh, face um, the issues of life and death or the meaning of life questions, you know. Uh, so um, I think um, the more than, you know, 2,500 years of philosophical uh, accumulation of philosophical discussions will have, um, yeah, certainly have a power to be a guide for the ordinary people to think when when they when they try to think about those um, basic philosophical philosophical questions. We um, philosophy can be a very good guide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and why is it that you focus so much of your work on the philosophy mm -hmm. of life? Is it because, for example, you think that there's some point in people's lives, even ordinary people's lives, that these questions go through their mind. And so you think mm -hmm. that perhaps it's, it has more of a practic practical side to it. Is it just because it happens that you're interested in it? Or what is the reason exactly? Uh, yes, um, I... 
because、um, the problem of philosophy of life or philosophy of death is、uh, my own existential problem. You know,、um, this is my, my own problem. So, as a philosopher, you, okay, I teach philosophy at,、uh, at a university, so I am a professional、um, a teacher. Okay, so、uh, in, in, in this sense, I can, yeah, and I have been teaching to、um, students on、um, philosophical issues. But at the same time, myself in my own life, I'm, I have my own、um, existential problem. And、uh, one, one, one of the biggest o n e is、um, the problem of death. Because、um, when I was an elementary school child,、uh, <laughs> you see, one day suddenly I came up with a big question what happens when I die? So, this was a very, very big shock to me when I first、uh, encountered this question because、um, I don't know why, the, the reason why I came up with this question. But anyway,、uh, the question, what, what happens when I die, fell upon to me. <laughs> so, and I encountered. That question. So,、um, looking back on my past, I think when I first enc encountered the, the question of this, I became a philosopher. So, you know, but then I was an elementary school child, so I didn't have words <laughs> to express、uh, my question itself. So, then, then but, but I, yeah, but. I asked some adults about this problem, but they didn't answer my question. So,、uh, yeah, then I started to think about this scary you know, question. So, of course, even now, I do not have a clear answer to this question, but I have been, yeah, I have been、um, thinking, yeah, continued. Have continued thinking about this problem for a very long period of time. So,、mm, yeah, for me,、um, I do philosophy for s o l v e these questions, you know, my existential philosophical problems. So, philosophy is not, for me, not just a puzzle solving game. Of course, you know, I like to, I, you know, I like to solve puzzles. <laughs> As an academic philosopher, I, I love to solve very complicated and difficult questions. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, this kind of existential problem is not, not a just a sol solving,、um, puzzle solving problem for me. It's a real, real problem for my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm.、uh, what is it that you call life studies? I mean, does、yes. it differ fundamentally from、uh, the philosophy、mm. of life or not?、Uh, what is it exactly? Yes,、um, yes I have、um, proposed the concept of life studies. And、uh, this, the, this term, life studies, a word I coined, I created in 1988 when I published my first book、uh, in Japanese. And it is a kind of Methodology, I don't know, for doing philosophy. And it, it's, an, it's a methodology that, that requires us to always refer to philosopher himself or philosopher herself when doing philosophy on a philosophical topic, especially an existential、um, topic. So, put it, to put it simply,、um, the essence of life studies. Is to never detach yourself from the subject you are thinking about, especially when you are、uh, thinking about the meaning of life issues. So,、um, I believe it is、um, important to share the reason why a philosopher himself or herself is thinking about certain p r o b l e m and how they have dealt. With the problem in their actual life so far. So,、uh, without it, what they do, philosophers do, is just a bystander analysis of the problem, you see. 
So, um, for example, I have just talked about my own uh, exist existential problem. What is death? What is life? And why, um, why I have, I'm living and such, such problems. So, um, if I if I talk about and thinking think about this kind of problem, um, only from a bystander's position, then the result, you know, the output of this my philosophical thinking will not be so impressive, a good one. Doesn't have a power to appeal to uh, the readers and appeal to other people who are interested in, in this uh, this kind of problem. So, in life studies. Yeah, so um, this is the reason why I uh, coined the, the term life studies. Um, okay, so for example, um, I published a book on uh, men's sexuality. Uh, yeah, and this book has been published, has been translated in, into English, so you can download from the internet. But um, when I wrote this book, I used this method, life studies. And I talked about, you know, I talked about my own sexuality in that book and um, delved into investigate a dark side of men's sexuality, you know, <laughs> that includes my own sexuality. I have an, um, I don't know, but I think many men have um, more or less have a dark side in their um, sexual desire and, and you know the sexual orientation such things so i as a philosopher i i wanted to investigate into this and um, deeper side you know the deeper level of a uh, man's sexuality in this case i didn't want to talk about it as a bystander you know by a neutral gender, because I am also I am a man, and, and and I have been raised as a as a man, so and I have I have had a huge influence from a man's culture, so um, I would like yeah I wanted to make clear what this um, yeah why and how my sexual orientation desires and other the other other various aspects. Um, has um, constructed inside me. So in this book, uh, the title is um, Confessions of a Frigid Man, A Philosopher's Journey into the Hidden Layers of Men's Sexuality. So in this book, I used the method of life studies. So I confessed about myself. Of course, you know, I couldn't um, confess everything, okay, okay, but I tried to confess as far as much as possible, you know, my dark side of my sexuality and my mistakes and other things, you know, I have experienced in my private life. life. So then using those um, experiences, I philosophize the essence of men's sexuality. So this is one example. Yeah, so as you know, um, ancient Greeks um, thought that philosophy is the investigation of yourself, myself, you know, <laughs> know yourself. <laughs> okay, so in order, in order to know myself, yourself, so I have to in investigate myself, yourself, mm -hmm. and who I am, who I have been. So, I think life studies is a method that, that takes this principle, ancient Greeks principle, very seriously. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so this is the, the out outline of the method of life studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would like now to get into some of the questions that are explored in your book, Manga, Introduction to Philosophy by mm -hmm. Mamaru and E. Sensei. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what is now? What does that mean mm. exactly? Yes. In the first chapter of Manga Introduction, I um, dealt with um, the philosophy of time. And in this chapter, I distinguished the concept of the present 
from the concept of now. So I think, you know, the pr present and the now is a different, different thing. And the, the present is an instant, you know, the sandwiched by <laughs> between the future and the past, you know, so that we have um, the future area, the huge area of the future, and the, on the other side, the past, the area, the past huge area, you know, so the, the pre present is um, just an instant sandwiched by both the present, both the, the future and the past. So, okay, so in this sense, uh, the present is an, just an instant, okay. But the not, but now is different. It's an arena or the ground of lived experiences. So the now is the arena on which various experiences and pop, pop up, pop up and appear and disappear. So the arena of now is a kind of a foundation of my whole experiences. So these two are very, very different. The, the one, the, the present is in just an instance. The other is the ground on which everything is on, on this ground. So, um, yeah, and looking at time from inside my life as an experience, so the future doesn't exist because, um, okay, the future is somewhere in the future and the, the past is have already passed. So then the question arises, what about the present? So my conclusion is the present doesn't exist either. Okay, so that is a instant. So the instance, we, we cannot see and th that instance. So the, that instance does not exist either. So um, looking from our, from my experience, the future doesn't exist, the past doesn't exist, and the present doesn't exist. Then what is ex what then what exists? The exist is now. Okay, so the now is the ground. So I'd like to uh, share um, again my manga introduction. Yes. Uh, okay. You can see. Mm, yes. Okay, can you yes, see? you okay. can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as you can see, um, the arena of now is like this. Okay, so there is a round table like ground. So this is the arena of now. And so on, the, on this arena, things arises into now and change within now and disappear from now. So um, this is my image of the arena of now. So this is a very different from the present as an instant. Okay, so um, I think um, the greatest uh, advantage of using manga illustration is to be able to show this kind of image directly. So we can com convey on this kind of image directly to the readers. So yes, I understand that, you know, cause this, is, this is just an image and so we need further um, uh, logical explanations for uh, analyzing this, this kind of things. So, yeah, but, but anyway, I, I would like to share my image with the readers. So um, this is my image of now, and this is different from the, the concept of um, the present, and the manga is great. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, this, this is uh, the, the rough um, explanation of what I have in mind mm -hmm. about the, the concept of now mm -hmm. and the present. Okay. Uh, and then you've already mentioned uh, the past, the present, mm -hmm. the future, but where do we get what you call mm -hmm. the concept of past, present, future mm -hmm. from? Yes, this is a um, big, yeah, this is also a difficult question to answer. And my, um, my intuition is that the concept of past, present, future is a social construction, mm. a kind of a social construction. Um, because um, this is a, 
that the concept of past, present, future is a very useful conceptual tool for the human being, us to survive the world. And especially um, we can predict uh, what happens when we, some, we do something, then what happens? Okay, so we uh, fall in an apple, then the apple fall, fall on to the ground. So this kind of movement, uh, we, can, um, we can describe this kind of uh, movement by using the concept past, present, and future. So um, this is great for our um, living and surviving um, in this, in our, uh, on this planet. So I, 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 I think, um, yeah. So um, I like to explain by um, this kind of uh, pragmatic uh, interpretation. So, and we have lived with the concept for a very long period of time so it has become our reality in the in our you know the long history so we are now regarding it as if it were a real existence so i think um, the concept of past present future is like the, the concept of a number you know uh, number is mean one two three four and uh, this num the num the number um yeah we use uh the number every day but does this number ex exist so this is a big problem a philosophical problem that's because um okay so we can see and touch and cup we can touch and see tables tables but we cannot touch see any number itself okay so um in this sense, the, the ontological status of number might resemble the ontological status of uh, past, present, future. Uh, we can't see or touch the past, present, future, future itself, but we, every day, we use the concept and we feel as if they, they are existing somewhere, <laughs> you see. so. Yeah, so this is my understanding of the concept, but 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 again, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to ask you a couple of questions about mm -hmm. death. So, yeah. since we never really get to notice that we are dead, at mm -hmm. least as far as we know, of course, do you think that we should fear? death or even the experience of dying? Um, I don't know, because, um, yes, actually, I fear my death very much. So now, even now, okay, so um, when I was an elementary school child, I feared death very much, but, but also still now, now I fear death, my death very much. So, um, And um, I don't know why I fear that my own death so much. And um, the cause of fear of death might be able to be explained by psychology, or it can be, you know, healed by psychotherapy. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I don't know. I don't think it is easy. Um, but interestingly, uh, you know. Um, during the time I feel fear of death, I am alive, you know. So it's a good thing for me, you, you, you see. <laughs> for me yeah. to be able to think about, uh, for me to be able to uh, be able to, for me to fear the death, during that time I am alive. I have, I have not dead yet. Okay, so uh, recently I come to th think that be able to think about the fear of death or um, the experience of time of fearing that death might not be so bad because um, during that time I am alive. I have not dead. <laughs> I, 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 I've not been dead. So uh, 
Yeah, the, 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 this idea is not, is um, very strange, but anyway. Okay, so anyway, the death is um, the state of nothing. If we do not believe in the next world, uh, the death is nothing. And, and the, but yeah, we have a, another idea, dying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the dying is the movement, movement from being alive to nothing. Okay, so I think the fear of death comes from this movement, and especially the anticipation of this movement. Um, in, the in the near future, this movement will occur. So this, this anticipation will, uh, this anticipation um, make me feel fear of death. So, um, but anyway, um, I, I I don't know if philosophy can deal with the fear of death. Um, I I don't think philosophy can help to disappear uh, the fear of death from me or from any other um, person. Um, I don't know, but it might be possible to support some kind of uh, hmm, to reach uh, some kind of kind of some kind of um, uh, so happy results I don't know you see you know I have a fear of death but I also have fear of not having fear of death you know <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I believe you, you can understand what I mean. So mm -hmm. um, I, ha I have a fear, but it is... stop fearing, stop, stop having fear of this is also a fear, fear for me. So uh, this is a so complicated um, situation. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know if this adds to the discussion or helps in any way, but we had philosophers like the Epicureans, for example, mm. that mm -hmm. told us to not fear death because since they didn't believe in life after death, so after we were dead, there was nothing and so nothing to fear, uh, nothing mm -hmm. bad happening. So we would ju we su should just feel at ease and in peace with the idea of death. So I don't yeah. know if that's mm -hmm. uh, an easy perspective to adopt or not, but at least there were mm -hmm. some ancient philosophers yes. that told us to not fear death because of these reasons. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. Um, but I, I think the problem is movement, you, you see, the movement from the existence to nothing. So the problem uh, remains how we should um, focus on and evaluate the, this movement, you know, itself. So Epicurus um, didn't talk about this movement itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is still remains a big philosophical problem yeah, for us, mm -hmm. even today. Yes. But do you think that even if one is not religious and uh, does not believe in life after death, that mm -hmm. there could be good reasons to believe that maybe death is not uh, nothing or a state of nothingness? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, it makes sense. Um, with regard to that question, um, I often think that uh, living an eternal life is also scary for me. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> um, because um, if um, this, okay, when I die in on earth, on, on the earth, then, oh yeah, it could be, you know, I might be able to continue living in the next world or something else, okay, so some, some other words. Um, yeah, it is possible. But in this, in in the, but in that case, uh, in in that uh, the next world, I will live, continue to live, and I don't know. Then I die again, and then I go to the the other 
other words, and then again and again and again. So um, in, in that sense, I have to, I will have to live forever and I will have to live an eternal life. And, but, but when I think of me living eternal life for more than, um, more than billions of years, okay, I, I, I think it's un, unbearable for me. So, um, I, you know, I know someone who prefers, prefers to live such a, you know, uh, that kind of um, eternal life. But uh, for me, um, living an eternal life is unbe unbearable and also in this case, scary. Okay, so <laughs> for me, this is scary, but living eternally is also scary. So there is no, <laughs> there is no way out <laughs> from this uh, um, problem. So yes, yeah. So um, believing in the existence of um, afterward, afterlife is reasonable. Yes. And I do not um, object to that kind kind of belief, but myself, for, for me, I I'm ag I'm agnostic, so I can't believe myself the existence of the the afterlife. So mm, and also, but you know, but because I can't believe in the afterward afterlife, that m makes me to the po to the <laughs> to the kind of a stalemate, you know, <laughs> both, <laughs> both is, both are scary. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is a big problem for me. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, and also to get uh, a, pers a perspective of how you think about life in general, at a, at a certain point in your manga, the sensei says, even if supposing that this world is full of inescapable boredom, depression, and unbearable pain and suffering, to me the fact that these things spring up into now itself is still incomparably joyful. So, uh, but I, I mean, first of all, is this really how you think about life? I mean, as being uh, full of boredom, depression, pain, suffering. And uh, do we really need to start from this premise to build up a philosophy that renders life bearable? Mm. Okay. Um, metaphysically um, speaking, I think we should distinguish the uh, unbearable life itself. Mm -hmm. from the popping up, you know, emergence of an unbearable life. And so the point is this, this, this um, distinction. And I think um, the popping up or emergence itself is a joyful event, C can be, yeah, can be considered as a joyful event because um, um, popping up or emergence enables us to experience the world so this kind of emergence enables us to experience the world itself. So I think um, I think that the fact that we can experience the world itself is a good thing. Um, so this movement from nothing to something, you know, is I I, I think it, it it is a good thing and can be said as a joyful thing um, because um, this kind of Without this kind of popping up or emergence, um, without this, the universe is complete nothing. There is no joy. Of course, there is no suffering, but there is there is no joy. Then, uh, so I feel that something has existed itself. Is considers metaphysically a joyful, positive uh, thing that, uh, yeah, such a joyful thing occurred. And, but, you know, the, Im the experience which emerged, you know, if it is um, 
that exper those experiences are the the experience of um, boredom, depression, and unbearable pain and suffering. This is a big problem. So um, yeah, this should be um, solved by any means. So, so um, if life, the content of life itself is a very bad, negative one, then we should try to find a way to resolve those negative experiences, those depression, suffering, and the, yeah, etc. So, yeah. So, so my point here is that we can philosophically distinguish the the popping up emergence itself from the the content of our experience or content of our life. Mm, so yeah. So in these pages, I would I wanted to um, say. But I, I, but but I understand that my description is not a sufficient one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I un yes I understand why you asked me um, <laughs> this question. Yeah, I, I yeah I agree in this. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and I also <laughs> asked you that because uh, of course I think that all people can relate mm. to these kinds of experiences like mm. depression, suffering, pain, boredom, yes. etc. Mm. But uh, perhaps uh, not all people, because of mm. their temperament or personality, uh, go through these kinds mm. of experiences to a point where they start questioning the meaning of life or if mm -hmm. life is worth living do you understand what i'm saying here but th there are some people that are uh, naturally uh, joyful and happy and don't tend to experience these kinds of things mm -hmm. uh, much or at least to a point where they start asking if really life is worth living and stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah Ah, uh, yeah, I understand what you mean. Um, you know, I think um, the philosophy of life or philosophy of um, life's meaning can help, in a sense, help them um, reach to their own solution to those um, um, suffering, uh, um, those um, depression, suffering um, kind of uh, mental problems, because um, I think um, philosophy of life's meaning can um, and disentangle, you know, the the the, the problems um, into which uh, such a person um, f fell into, you know. Uh, so um, the philosophy has the power to um, clarify logically the, the the structure of of, of the um with the suffering um the structure of the hmm, how can i say structure of the problem of suffering and pains um so by using um a kind of philosophical um power or philosoph philosophical um knowledge and way of thinking um, people may have be able to um, make make an order to to to, to clarify um, their the, um, I don't know how, how to say oh, okay so so to so, so, so clarify their um, state of mind by using um logical reasoning uh, yeah so i don't think philosophy can resolve every uh, such mental problems I, I i never think like that but philosophy can assist for them to um, recover from their um, sufferings okay suffering so um in this sense i think philosophy of life and death um, should be developed with the help of ordinary people's experiences. And so we have to cooperate between professional 
professional philosophers and ordinary people uh, because um, we can really, yeah, um, cooperate. We can really understand with each other yeah, on, on this topic because um, this, um, we, we all, all of us um, can understand and experience, yeah, and understand what is the problem with the, um, that kind of um, existential problem. So, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, but, but I, <laughs> I don't think I can. I could um, reply to you, uh, your question correctly, but anyway, I yes, I have uh, such things, these things in mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's move on to another topic that is also explored in your manga. Uh, mm. What is it to exist? And since we've already <laughs> talked about the concept of now, uh, is there a relationship there between existing and now? Existing existence and now, yeah, this is a <laughs> oh, again big problem, big question. S um, I think okay, yeah, and as I as I said in my manga book, um, there is a similarity between the concept of existence and the concept of now, and the. The similar point is that both are kind of arena, you know, on which everything appears and disappears. So um, as for the arena of now, I have just show you um, the image of my the, the arena of now, which are, which are in my mind. And the, this, the similar situation is all, also uh, applied to the concept of existence. Uh, because um, there is an existence as an arena, as an arena, and mm -hmm. everything pops up, <laughs> pops up and disappears um, to the to the arena of the existence, ar the arena of the existence, and disappear from the arena of, of existence. So, and if we um, think of the existence like this, so we can see similarity between. Um, existence and now, but there is also, of course, difference between these two concepts. Um, the most big, the most, um, yeah, big difference is time flows. You know, okay. So they are on the arena of now. Time flows, so everything changes, but on the arena of existence. Existence does not flow. Existence exists. That's mm -hmm. all. <laughs> okay. So um, mm, this way of saying it uh, sounds a, a little bit absurd. But anyway, you know, the time flows, but the existence doesn't flow. So this is a uh, difference. Okay. So I think we can see both similarity and the difference between now and existence. Mm -hmm. uh when it comes to the relationships we establish with other people, because we cannot really have access to other people's minds, mm. I mean, there are probably many aspects of other people that we can never fully understand. I mean, does that, uh. does that tell us that we can't really uh, establish relationships with other people, or is that uh, an exaggeration? Mm, yes. Um, the problem, yeah, in philosophy, we have the problem of other minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, this is also an um, unsolved question. Yeah, so um, we know, we, we think that me, myself, exist, but there is no evidence that the other person exists uh, inside the other, other people's body or brain. Okay, this is the other mind problem. And, but relationship with other people is possible. Oh, this is a fact, you know, for example, now I'm, I have a relationship with you on the screen <laughs> via, you know, uh, internet. So it is possible for us to uh, have a relationship with other people. Okay, so um, 
this is a this is a fact. So this is true. So the um, and also it is possible to understand to other people or, or other people's uh, mind, heart, intention, and those are those things. You know. So um, this this is also the fact in our everyday life. I understand the other people's my family members and feelings and everything you know and sometimes i i made a big mistake about the uh, the other 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 people's you know <laughs> um feelings and ideas and opinions but anyway i we can understand other other um people's mind and the problem is you know what is the other mind itself so I think the other mind is not an entity. Entity means uh, something that exists um, with its own force. You know, <laughs> the like 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 a small ball floating on on the space. This kind of thing. You know, um, I don't think that the other mind is not a small ball which exists inside your brain. Uh, so then. The question arises, then what is the other mind? If it is not the entity, then what is it? So, so, so this is a very, very difficult philosophical question. And at the same time, very interestingly, if we uh, think like this, me, myself, I, you know, myself is not an I entity as well. I can't see myself anywhere. So if we uh, like the the manga manga uh, illustration that I, I have just show you showed you, um, if I look into my brain, I can't see anything, any small ball <laughs> floating on my brain. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I myself is not an entity, but the problem is. Um, but anyway, I feel very strongly that something is. <laughs> Inside me, inside my body, I feel so. Yeah, there is something, something in me which is uh, now speaking, <laughs> something, some subject in, in inside myself. So what is this? If this is not an entity, then what is this? So this is a, uh, yeah, very difficult, unsolved philosophical. Problem. So I think you know the the problem of um, communication is basically uh, resolved because um, this is a, already this is a fact that we can communicate yeah, more more or less. But the problem, the real ex, the real problem is what is I, what is other minds, and such. Yeah, question is very difficult to answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and this connects connects to your concept of the solipsistic mm. being, correct? Yeah. Mm. Yes, so this is the most controversial <laughs> pages in my manga in introduction. And I have had um, various comments from my Japanese reader readers. And, um, okay. The solipsistic being is the being we can find by purifying the uniqueness of the first person's way of existence. So, yes, I am the first, I'm the first person, and I am very unique in this in its existence in the universe because I am very different in existence from you or any other you you you. Okay, so. And also, I can say that the, the number of being is only one in the universe. Okay, so mm, I, I think everyone can understand what I mean, basically, because um, I think everyone feel that everyone himself or herself is very unique in their existence. So, um, but it is very difficult to um, clarify this uniqueness. 
this is philosophical problem. Okay, so the the concept of a solipsistic being is to is an endeavor to clarify the uniqueness of the of the subject. Uniqueness of the first person's um, existence, and also it is so unique that so we cannot identify who is the solipsistic being by using the proper name of a person. So, okay, so if I say here the solipsistic being is Morioka, then you, <laughs> you, you will negate easily negate it instantly and say, you say, oh no, the solipsistic being is me. Probably you would say like this. So, and it's, this is very, very interesting that solipsistic being cannot be identified by using proper name. So um, this topic is connect, deeply connected with the problem of proper name in analytic philosophy. Okay, I'd like to um, share again uh, mm -hmm. from my uh, manga book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here is the pages which I, in which I um, discussed about, discussed the solipsistic beings. So then here, um, so they, Sensei and Mamaru Kun, talk, talk, have talk, talked about uh, what what is I and where is um, the true I, and the Sensei um, talk talk about the concept of a solipsistic being and where is this um, yeah solipsistic being and the 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 left uh, person Mamaru Kun says it's right here, okay. He points to his um, brain. Who is the solipsistic being? And he says, I am, I am the solipsistic being. Then mm. Sensei said, wrong, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the Mamarukun was very surprised. And Sensei said, the solipsistic being is not you. And it isn't right there. The solipsistic being is you. Yes, so <laughs> so I'm very in I yeah I'm very interested in it. How do you think? How do the viewers think when you watch this picture? Solipsistic being is you. You means you know the sensei is now pointing to you. Okay. So this is a concept of um, the place of of the solipsistic being. By using that picture, and we can say, we can determine the place of the solipsistic being. So the place of the solipsistic being can be directly determined by the pointing of a finger, <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, this structure is, I think, very, very interesting because, you know, um, the solipsistic being is a purified something of the first person uh, way of existing, but for but you know when when we um, when we determine the place of the solipsistic being, we should say you, not I, not but you. Okay. So um, this is interesting because um, the, the, the purification of I should be, co should be um, determined by the word you. So I think this says um, there is a very strange um, structure of, uh, mm, I don't know, existence of a person, uh, which I, we have, ne we have n not being clearly have been um, discovered. So, yeah, this is the solipsistic being. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the lives we live also because of the mm. concepts we've been exploring here and how we tend to think about life uh, and uh, time, for example, do you think that the kind of the lives we live 
are illusions? Mm. I don't think so. Um, our lives are not illusions. Our life itself is not illusions. And this is different from um, Buddha's um, ideas. <laughs> yes, I love um, Buddha's philosophy very much, but in, on this point, I differ from Buddha's ideas. So Buddha, Buddha thinks that our life is illusion. Okay? Mm -hmm. yes. So he thinks that we have to escape from this, um, uh, this illusion. But I, I, I do not think so. Um, our life, our lives is not, our lives are not illusions. We have to continue to live these actual lives and we have to solve um, problems inside our actual lives on the earth. So this is my belief, <laughs> okay? So, and, and, and I, I think illusions are other minds. Other minds are illusions. Mm -hmm. Other minds as an entity is illusion and I as an entity is also illusions. And for example, the present as an instant is my, maybe an, another illusion. Okay, so um, we have many other illusions, but as I think, lives are not illusions. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, I've already asked you about now and you've showed us mm -hmm. the arena of now. What about birth? Is there something yeah. special about being born? Yeah, I think, yes. Um, I, I have shown you the arena of now, and that is on um, the chapter one of my uh, manga introduction book. Then, you know, um, during, uh, yes, I wrote that book. Um, it, it took five years or so to finish that book. So, and in, in the chapter four, the last chapter of the book, then I came with some um, idea that there is another arena. The another arena is the arena of birth. Mm. So now I think mm, time is um, con constituted by these two arenas, arena of now and the arena of birth. So uh, the difference is that um, arena is now, is now, okay, now occurring is, is an arena of now. On this mm -hmm. arena, everything is occurring now. Yes. But birth is different, you know. Um, mm, I I have been born, okay. Yes, I have been born. I have been born is not, not an occurrence. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I have been born is, is something which come comes to me when I look look back on my past and, oh, I have uh, lived such and such um, events and survived and have uh, such and such experiences and uh, I'm now living here. Okay, so this kind of um, movement from the from the unknown past past to the to the, the present now I don't know, you know, but this 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 kind of um, movement. Um, is is the birth where I have been born itself? Okay, so um, this is a when if I if I can use German, um, it's a werden. You, you you see, so becoming in English, it's becoming. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, becoming is becoming and being is different. <laughs> so yeah, so so. Um, I think you know the birth is an um, yes birth is a um, kind of a uh, birth is a um, sort of becoming, mm -hmm. and now is um is uh, it has a um, relate to existing being, so I think being and becoming is different. So the now and birth birth having been, having been born is also difference in nature. Yeah, so, but this is just an, still an image, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do not, I haven't been able to um, give a clear logic to this 
point. But anyway, I'm now thinking about uh, um, this this point by using this kind of image between you know becoming and becoming and being now and birth. So these uh, these two completely different uh, aspects of the world of the universe. Yeah, we live in in between these two. Mm. Mm -hmm. two aspects yeah this is what i have in mind yes so um do you have any specific position on anti-natalism i've already mm. had on the show uh, perhaps the biggest living proponent of anti-natalism david benatar uh, and since we've been talking here about things like uh, boredom depression pain suffering uh, i mean it is it, this is an ethical position of course it's not necessarily within the realm of philosophy of life even though it also makes claims about what life is but do you have any opinion on antinatalism mm -hmm. yes um antinatalism is um of course, a big, very big problem and for me. And I have published a long overview paper in English uh, in 2021 and published. Uh, and, and that, that English um, paper is, um, can be downloaded from the internet. So please um, download and read. And I have published a um, book of antinatalism in Japanese in two, 2020. And so, yes, I have studied um, the antinatalic thought from the very pa past, from, from the um, great, uh, Greece and India to the, the present time. And I have a huge sympathy on antinatalism, especially on birth negation. Birth negation means oh, uh, never, um, better never to have been. So it, it'll be better, I have never been born. Okay, so this kind of birth negation, I have, yes, I have a sympathy because um, inside me, uh, I have a strong feeling of birth negation. Yes, I think I had never been born to this world, to this new universe. And so basically, I have a sympathy um, on the antinatalism itself, especially the birth negation. And but I think I have already been born, <laughs> okay, yes. here. So it, it it is impossible for me to go back to nothingness, okay. So what I have to do now as a as an existence which have been already born to this world, um, I think I have to. I, I oh, I, I'm sorry. I think I want to reach and um, kind of a birth affirmation uh yeah a birth affirmation means the affirmation of my having been born to this particular life and i think i don't i haven't reached this kind of birth affirmation myself so i think uh, philosophy philosophy of life um, can support for people who want to affirm their having been born to their own particular lives. So, yes, so I'm now um, writing a huge book on birth affirmation, the philosophy of birth affirmation, and I'm now thinking about uh, what is birth affirmation and um, how should philosophy uh, can support those people who are suffered from the negation of their life and the negation of their having been born. And about the David Veneta, yes, I, I had a discussion with him and and I read his papers and his book books and I understand what she what he means, but I think his discussion is um uh, is has some flaws. Yeah, has um, I don't his his philosophical discussion succeeded succeeded it in yeah the correctness of um, antinat his antinatalistic views. So yeah, so um, 
Yes, so I, I think I can um, show you why I think like that, but it, it's so, you know, so <laughs> academic and so complicated. So and I think it, it, it is um, impo impossible for me to um, show you now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, I think um, his logic has a um, big problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, his logic includes um, the big flaws in his logical um, reasoning. Mm -hmm. So I object to his um, argument. But again, I understand what he means. And I have a strong sympathy with birth negation. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, so. <clears throat> Uh, if you're open to that suggestion, maybe in the future we can arrange another conversation <laughs> just mm -hmm. to get into the nitty gritty of uh, antinatalism and where you think David mm -hmm. Benatar's arguments are wrong. So, mm -hmm. but since we are already here, as you say, we already exist, do you think it makes sense? Uh, to commit suicide? Mm. Yeah, um, basically, I don't want anyone I know to commit suicide. And theoretically speaking, um, if, if a person has come to a state of birth affirmation and thinks that today is a good day, for me to die, <laughs> then suicide might make sense for that person. Okay, so yeah, but this is a, a theoretically um, thinking. Uh, this is the, yeah, theoretically speaking, I, I think we can say this. Uh, if, if someone say truly believes that what I have been born is very good and my life is very good and today is a very good timing for me to die myself. So there might be no reason to, um, yeah, forbid him or her for commit suicide. Okay, but again, if a person commits suicide because of the despair he or she experiences, this is sad very, very sad. So I don't want that to happen. Mm. Um, so uh, this is my mm, feeling. This is my opinion. So of course, you can find a discrepancy between my theoretical ideas and my, <laughs> my personal <laughs> uh, feelings, my personal uh, position and opinions. But anyway, this is what I have, my, what I have in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm. Do, do you think that uh, the position you have on suicide particularly, but on death more generally, mm. could it have something to do with your being Japanese and Japanese culture? Because as far as I know, uh, Japanese culture deals with death uh, in a different way than we Westerners and Western culture deals with it. Mm. Yes, um, generally you can say that and I understand what you mean. But you know, the Japanese society has changed a lot from the last World War II. So, um, our, <laughs> okay, 75 years has or have already passed since the, uh, the defeat <laughs> of the World War II. And so um, our society has greatly been influenced by American culture and also European Western culture and way of thinking. So we are now, uh, as a nation, we are a, a, a part of the Western alliances, you know, <laughs> the Western um, world. So um, I think um, currently many people living in, in Japan, um, their uh, view of life and death are very similar to the, those of Western countries. But the difference, of, of course, um, there is a difference. Um, the difference is com comes from the 
from the religious um, aspects because um, in Japan, there are, you know, on the, the, the number of Christians is only 1%. 1% mm -hmm. of the over society uh, is a um, Christian, Christians. So um, I think um, there are not so, there has been not so big influence uh, from the Christian idea of life and death in, in, in our um, ideas or images of life and death. So um, this might be a di um, big difference um, between the Western countries and um, people in the Western countries and Japanese people. So um, most, uh, most of us uh, say that we do not believe in uh, the, the eternal life provided that is to be provided by God or something like that. So, um, and many of us believes in the um, the kind of afterlife. You know, uh, if we if we die, we go into some other uh, other world, and then other worlds, and then come to this world as a person or as a as a uh, animal. You see, the, this kind of one Buddhist, Indian kind of a reincarnation still, um, yeah, is, is exist in our country, um, and among among ordinary people. So this might be very different from Western cultures. Cultures, but anyway, I think um, current Japanese people, especially younger generation, um, is, um, younger generation's view of life becomes very similar to the Western people, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. So uh, I know that you tend to be critical of at least some aspects of life and lifestyle in contemporary society. Mm. Uh, why is that and uh, what would you say are some of the biggest issues in contemporary industrialized societies? Yes. Um, on this um, on this point, on this topic, I have published a book called "Painless Civilization," and in that book, I coined the term "painless civilization," and I argued that for contemporary societies in advanced countries are now progressing toward the state of painless civilization, and which is the yeah. So in our civilization, we gain more and more pleasure and pleasantness and comfort in our presentation, uh, in our civilization, especially in in the urban areas. And but we gradually lose joy of life and true happiness. Okay, so the, so this is a, the basic um, argument in my book and and. Yeah, so mm, our our current civilization gives us um, plenty of pleasure, ple pleasantness, comfort, but at the same time, they um, deprive us of true happiness and true meaning and joy of life. And we know this fact all of us know this fact, but we cannot escape from this tide, you know, of painless civilization because um, in living in such a civilization is comfortable, really comfortable, and we never wish to go outside of it. So we understand what I just said, but it is very hard for us to actually escape from this kind of painless civilization um, and we are now going to a living corpse, at the state of living corpse. <laughs> like, uh, yes, so this is a, a criticism of contemporary civilization. So, uh, so you know, this book, my book, uh, Painless Civilization, was published in 2003, and this, this was a very thick 
book, so it's impossible for me to summarize <laughs> uh, now in a simple word. But anyway, uh, the chapter one of this book has been translated into English, and you can download freely from the internet. So if you have interest, please download and read and criticize me. <laughs> yeah, because I'm I'm now still thinking about this topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but do you think that these problems that you associate with modern mm -hmm. society uh, get manifested differently in uh, individualistic societies like the Western ones versus the more collectivist ones like mm -hmm. the Eastern Asian ones like Japan, South Korea, China, for example, or is it that you don't really see that big of a difference? Yes, um, I think the power of Spanish civilization is that they um, wins the difference between cultures. So because and th th this means that, you know, um, the Spanish civilization is now covering every part of the, 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 the earth, you know. The, the societies like the United States and North America, European countries and some um, East Asian countries like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan uh, and especially um, urban areas and people living in urban er areas are now um, going, progressing in, toward the painless civilization and there is no, I think there is no um, cultural um, differences on this point. And so, um, yes, yeah, so, so my, my guess is that there is no um, cultural differences when we talk about, when we're thinking about painless civilization this kind of pathology of um, contemporary civilization. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, and so what do you make of phenomena in Japanese society, mm. like the hikikomori uh, plummeting rates of sex and romantic relationships and married mm. life, because those have been recent th trends in Japan, uh, do you think that those are also symptoms of the ones you're referring to? Yes, um, mm. yes, uh, in contemporary Japanese society, uh, yes, young men have become more non-violent <laughs> than the <laughs> older generations, and yeah, this is a fact, uh, yeah. And, Actually, from the statistics, and we can see um, there are uh, smaller, um, fewer violences among Japanese uh, youngsters than the older or middle-aged men. Okay, so I, I think this is a good thing, and mm, and I have called this phenomenon, this inclination, uh, the phenomenon of herbivore man. You know, the gentleman phenomenon, uh, and so. It is true that younger generation, especially younger men, have become more gender neutral and less act, um, less active on romantic rela relationships. And yeah, yes, and, and this is an interest, interesting phenomenon uh, you can see. So now it's in 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 the you know <laughs> these. Uh, couple of years, it's called Corona world, so it's impossible to come to Japan. But after the Corona pandemic, and please come to Japan and Tokyo, Osaka and Kyoto. And then you can see, uh, so the, the you can see gen gender neutral and gentle young men. <laughs> and, and and also they are there and they are very fashionable like girls. Okay, so mm, it's I think it's uh, interesting. So, interesting to see um, their uh, yeah, looks and other things. So I think the cause, the reasons, uh, the cause of this phenomenon is, uh, I suspect it's on Japan's um, 75 years of peace 
after the World War II. Okay, so yes, so um, after World War II, Japan was、um, protected by the U.S. military force. So、um, that is because、um, the U.S.、Um, didn't allow us to、um, build up military force in Japan. So、um, and also we declared not、uh, fight. Any war against any other countries in in our constitution, so、uh, we haven't had any warfare with any other countries for for these seventy five years. So seventy five years is a very long period of time, you know. So it's surprising that in Japan, in current, you know, it's seventy five years. So if we come to Tokyo and look around the city, and everybody. Does not have any experience to go to the to battlefield. No, yeah, there is no one who have an experience of fight、um, with other、um, soldiers. You know, in this sense, Japan is a very very peaceful nation. So, and during this long period of time, we we have lost the reason to. To be a soldier, especially a man, we lost the reason to. Men, Japanese men, have lost the reason to become soldiers. So they, I think this this is the reason why Japanese men become has become have become gender neutral and more and they have lost um, violence. Um, mm. Yeah. So this is.、Um, However, I have this have this has a close relationship of plummeting rates of sex and romantic relationships. Okay, <laughs> because、um, we men don't have to be men. Okay,、mm-hmm. we don't have to be full of testosterone,、uh, testosterone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because we don't have to fight against any anybody in in the battlefield.、Uh, so I I I think this is on、uh, Japan's long. Period of peace may have been the reason for our、mm, plummeting rates of sex and romantic relationships, and also hikikomori. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, we've focused a lot in this conversation on your book, manga introduction、mm-hmm. to philosophy, and of course, you use the medium of manga to convey. Philosophical ideas, but are you also a manga reader? Do you consume manga, and do you think that、uh, there are at least some manga out there that also convey philosophical ideas in a good way?、Um, yes, as、uh, as for manga, you know, ma Japan is a nation of manga, <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so ev- everybody、uh, loves and enjoys manga and anime, and so even you know even university professors loves very much, and they talk about they talk much about、uh, the mangas and animes they have seen, <laughs> watched uh, recent uh, yeah recently. So、um, there is no discrimination about you know the talking about manga here in Japan. So.、Um, It is so. It is very easy. It was very easy for me to、um, publish a, a manga introduction to philosophy、uh, here in Japan.、Uh, so that book was、um, published by a Kodansha、um, publication. So the Kodansha publication is a number one public publisher in Japan. So very famous and authentic, and you know,、um, very good publisher. So and that publisher is、um, very welcome. For me to write a manga introduction to philosophy from their lineups. Okay, so、um, this shows that、um, there is no、uh, special hesitation or anything for Japanese people to write, write or read or discuss manga. And so we we, we discuss everything、um, via the media, manga, manga and anime, and and yeah, and. So, so、um, 
the father of Japanese manga, the, the founding father of Japanese manga is um, Osamu Tezuka. Uh, he's a, yes, and he has, have a, he has had a very big influence on us. And yes, especially um, his, uh, his manga, Astro Boy. And um, I think Astro Astro Boy is uh, translated in English and other other languages and also uh, filmed by some, uh, yeah, I don't know, but there is a film on his uh, Astro Boy. So many people now know, may know in the world and Tezuko, Osamu Tezuka's um, Astro Boy. And this is a story of a robot. And um, this, uh, this manga was, um, appeared in 1952 to 1968. Mm -hmm. So very old one, but the the theme is philosophy of life. Yeah, so I was very, I, yeah, I was very influenced when I was a child from the Tezuka Osamu's and um, mangas and anime. And the theme of his uh, manga is uh, what is life? What is death? what is to live and um, what is the love and and also what is technology because um, the Astor boy he's a um, robot um, boy and he has a human mind human heart but his body is a robot so he um, yeah so so he was um, yes yeah, so uh, yeah, so he fight for the justice and and he help on job, uh, for the human race. But 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 again, he is not, you know, he is an existence just between robot and human race. Yeah. So he, so this is his problem. And anyway, so um, what what I want to say is that. In Japanese history of manga, the, the 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 topic of philosophy of life and death is um, one of the biggest topic in Japanese and manga and anime, and so um, I think it is for me it is a good media for me to um, express my um, philosophical concepts and ideas and and discussions in the form of manga. It, so it, it is very reasonable for me to uh, use uh, man manga and yes. And someday I hope someone will make anime for my <laughs> using my uh, manga in introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that would be great. I, I mean, I, I have to personally say that I'm also a very big fan of manga and anime uh, yeah. and Japanese cinema as well. So some of my favorite manga, just to put it out there, are Kentaro Miura's Berserk, for example, mm -hmm. and Monster Oyasumi Pum Pum. For, uh, so just to yeah. put some names out mm. there. So uh, apart from Astro Boy, do you have any other favorite manga of yours? Or um, my favorites are very old ones because um, uh, I haven't read any current mangas. So. And and my favorite are classic ones and one is um, Tezuka Osamu's and Phoenix. Do you know um, the, the title of the, his man, uh, manga, the Phoenix Firebird? Uh, okay, um, I, I'm not sure if the, um, this manga has been have been um, translated, but anyway, I think um, Tezuka's and Phoenix is one of the most important um, work. Of, uh, yeah, of him and, and the topic of this manga is, yes, philosophy of life. Okay, and and I also like um, Nagai goes and Dev Devil Man, Devil Devil Man. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, Devil Man. Uh, do you know, know that? Uh -huh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I love I love that um, that manga. That was a very dark <laughs> manga, but I I love yeah I, I love it. And also, I, I don't think this is um, this has been translated in in foreign languages. But um, Takemi Keiko's 
um, the song of winds and trees. Uh, this is called, this is a genre of, uh, genre of an, um, mm, girls manga, uh, shoujo manga, the girls manga. Um, and this de this manga deals with um, kind of an L LGBT uh, issues. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And also, this is the first manga which dealt with um, um, boys' love, you know, the ro romantic love between boys, boys and boys. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but this is great. I think this is great. So, I I, I, I don't think, I'm not sure if um, this, the, the, the last one, the last one has been translated and published in other countries because, uh, this might be a problem for some other countries because you know they depicted <laughs> and there are many controversial depictions um, yeah in, in in this manga so but, but I, I'm not sure but anyway this manga this is a, a classic and great mangas but you know these three mangas are all old ones you know in the 20th century <laughs> yeah so it, it's very interesting so you know, I don't know anything about contemporary this centuries and Japanese manga. So recently, foreign young people um, teach teach me about the current Japanese manga. So they know very much about you know Japanese manga and anime, and they know very very well about them better than me. So this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I I was aware at least of. A devilman and uh, I mm -hmm. have read it so and I know that it was also very influential for more recent manga like Akumetsu for example there's a mm -hmm. manga out there with that name that was very heavily influenced by devilman and also uh, Kentaro Miura's Berserk mm -hmm. uh, was also influenced by it so uh, Dr. Morioka, uh, just before we go, uh, I will be leaving a link to your book mm -hmm. in the description box of the interview. Would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, excuse me, what is the question? Uh, if you would like... Oh, yeah, basically, if you search my name on the internet, so then naturally you can <laughs> And be led. You can be led to some works um, which which are has been have been written in English. So you can find my um, English translations on my papers and some books. Yeah. So please search <laughs> on the internet. Okay. So thank you very much for your time, <laughs> and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Yes, me too. Thank you very much. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dramiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, 
João Linhares, Lida Cosmides, Aima Fusal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC, My Producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vengnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Ujeski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.